away with a question, and it's, it's a pretty simple question. You can respond if you'd like. Do you believe in God? And the second question is, what do you mean by that? You see, I think the reality is we walk in here this morning and the heart of the city of Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the country, we have different ethnicities, nationalities, backgrounds, church backgrounds, no church background at all. As we walk in here this morning and sing songs about God and proclaim God through his word and pray to God and all these different things, all of us walk in here with different presuppositions about God, different ideas about God, different conceptions based on our experiences about God. And so some of us in this room, if we're honest, hey, we see God as a ruler and we'll submit to him. Like we'll come to church and get ready and dress nice because God's like a ruler and you're supposed to do that and you're a little bit scared of him. Some of us, you see God the opposite of that, right? You see God as primarily relationship and you see God as like a best friend who will carry you when life gets hard. Some of you may, you may never say this, but you see God as a genie and he's just there to, to, to grant all your wishes and help you accomplish all of your dreams. And, and the reality is I could go on and on with that list. Like all of us come in here with different ideas about who God is. And this is so important. A.W. Tozer, an old theologian said this way, that what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Someone else said it this way, that your view of God determines your response to God. That that how you view God, if he's really big, then you'll give your whole life to him. You'll you'll worship him. You'll obey him. You'll you'll give him even your wallet. You'll give him your kids and your marriage and your, your problems and your victories. If you view God as that big, then you'll see him as big over the top of everything. And then your whole life fits up under him. And you want to help other people see God just like that. Your response to God will be directly related to how big you see God as. And the exact opposite is also true. If you have a small view of God, and he's just down here, and he's compartmentalized over here in this area of your life, one hour of your 168 hours in the week, you'll, you'll give them church, and I'll read some scriptures every once in a while, and I'll try to find somebody to serve. If your view of God is that small, then you will stack thing upon thing over and above him in your life. Finances, your job, your friendships, your deadlines, your class schedule, Instagram, if you view God as small. Because the way you view God will dictate how you respond to God. It's like in marriage, uh, I've done so many weddings where at the beginning, man, I, the couple's getting ready to get married, premarital counseling, they're engaged, they're excited, they're planning the wedding day, and man, they see each other as so big. And they see each other as so big that they'll do crazy things, like spend three to six months to 12 months of their salary on a shiny rock. They'll, they'll do things that they've never done in their life, like write poetry, They'll do things like they'll, they'll burn CDs of their favorite songs and they'll, they'll drop them in her uh, mailbox in college where, when she doesn't know and she'll just get that as a surprise. I'm telling my story a little bit right now and I'm dating myself in the process. You, you'll do crazy things because you'll see, well, she's so big and he, he's so big. And, and then on the flip side, several years later, if you could be a fly on the wall in a marriage counseling room, man, things have changed. They've seen the ugliness of each other's sin. The, the rock's still on the finger and it's shiny, but their marriage is, is pretty dull. And they start to not see each other as big. They, they start to find ways each other is small. And instead of finding their strengths, they see, well, no, that's, I see that as a weakness. And, and, and over the years, that's what begins to happen. And the, then the way they see each other affects how they respond to each other. So, so you start hearing them say things like, well, I'll do this if she does that. Well, I'll, I'll commit to this, but first he's got to say this. And you know what? Maybe it's not even worth trying anymore. Maybe this marriage has been over for a long time. And their response is directly related to their view of the other person. And so what I always do in those moments, what I like to do is I always say, okay, you've told me about the now. You've told me about the present. You've told me about the conflict. Now I want you to tell me about the beginning. 
I, tell me, I'll just ask them like, hey, tell me about how you proposed, which is always a little bit awkward because they want to be mad right now. And I'm like, no, tell me how you proposed. Who was there? What'd you feel? Tell me, tell me about the wedding day. Tell me about the honeymoon. Tell me about your first home. And they're like, no, no, I don't talk about it right now. I'm mad at her. No, just let's go back. Hit pause. And let's go back to the beginning. And how did you view her? How did you view him at the beginning? And how could you respond today in light of that? And I tell you that because that's what we're doing today. We're gonna go back to the very beginning of our Bibles, Genesis chapter one. You shouldn't need your table of contents. Just turn to the first page. And we're gonna start this brand new series in the beginning. And we're gonna look at God and who he truly is and and how big he, he truly is. And then we're gonna shape and form our response to God after that. See, as we look at the story of Genesis, man, we're gonna spend nine weeks in the book of Genesis and it's a story about a lot of things. It's a story about creation. It's a story about humanity. It's a story about marriage and sin and sex and and shame and purpose and work. It's a story about a lot of things, but over and above all those stories is a meta-narrative, a meta-story, a grand story. And it's a story about God. And what I hope for in this series is that in your life, however you view God right now, that it would just get a little bit bigger. And as a result, your response would get bigger too. And so we wanna help you with that. AC mentioned it. We gave you this study guide when you walked in. I'd love for you to grab it right now. You can just thumb through it briefly with me. You'll see an introduction at the very beginning. You'll see how to use this guide, a table of contents for every week of this series. You'll see a place to take notes. I hope you'll do that. That's how you remember things. That's how you embed in your life who God is and his character and his nature, that you would take notes. You can see you can do that today. You'll see our sermon title for today is Out of Nothing. And then you'll see some questions and, and thoughts and for reflection. And you're meant to go through that with other people during the week in a community group. And some of you, the reality is you're, you're not in a community group and it's intimidating to go to somebody's home and study scripture. And so what we are doing is life in community, a six week, not a commitment forever, a six week community group on campus. The reality is our church is growing and we can't fit y'all in everybody's home anyway. Right, And so we're bringing it to the church. So February 6th, we're starting a community group at the church. And we'd love for you, if you're not in a community group, come and go through this study guide and journey with us to see how big God truly is. All right, so we wanna help you. And today we're gonna look at Genesis chapter one. Uh, We're gonna see this idea of out of nothing. And as we look at it, if you're new to the Bible, God gives Genesis through a guy named Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of our Bible called the Pentateuch. And God gives Genesis through this guy, Moses, in a very specific time, not 2024 in America. He gave it to the Israelites after they had been rescued out of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt. And in Egypt in this time, they had about 2,000 deities, 2,000 gods. And so the primary purpose of Moses writing to the Israelites about the creation of all things is to show them who God is. So as you take notes, that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna give you three characteristics just from Genesis chapter one of who God is. The first thing is this, if you wanna write this down, God is self-existent. God is self-existent. We see that from the opening verses of scripture. Chapter one, verse one, look at it with me. It says this, in the beginning, God. Grammar students, notice this. God is the first subject in all of the Bible that it all starts with him because the whole Bible, the whole universe is all about him, amen? And that's how it's set up. And that's what we're meant to see in creation. And here's the reality is many of us struggle in life because we don't start with him, we start with us. The reality is today in 2024 in America, we live in a self-help, self-care, treat yourself culture, right? And, And let me tell you, it's good to know yourself. But if you know more about your personality than you do about the attributes of God, then something is off and you will never find true purpose and joy and meaning in life. Why? Because life is set up, not with in the beginning you, but in the beginning God. It all starts with him. 
And the reality is in this day as well, sometimes they may have thought it starts with us. Like God rescued us out of slavery in Egypt. We're God's people. Like we're his, his, his chosen, we're his favorites. And he rescued us out of slavery and darkness and sin. And now we are free. And God through Moses is reminding them, I did that for you, but it's not about you. It's about me. See, what's interesting, if you can just put yourself in this place and time, that these Israelites who are reading this about who God is, how it all starts with him, that basically what they knew about God, this is before scripture, right? Put yourself back there. All they knew is God is a rescuer. They were enslaved. He rescued them. Now they're free. That's all they knew. They didn't know creator. They didn't know all powerful sustainer of the universe. They don't know much about the character and nature, person and work of God yet. And so Moses says, hey, you need to know this. And we got to go all the way back to the beginning so you can see who God truly is. And what I love about our church, man, it's so good that we're doing this series right now so we can do that. The reality is some of you have been coming to this church for years and years and years. But there's a lot of you that are brand new, new to the faith. Last year, we had 55 baptisms just last year alone. February 11th, we already have several of you signed up to get baptized and celebrate your new faith in Jesus. I mean, we love that, amen? And some of you, more of you need to sign up to get baptized on February 11th to celebrate that in obedience to who God, what God has done in your life. But the reality is some of you, man, you're like, man, I know that Jesus rescued me out of sin, self-righteousness and shame and brought me into new life. I'm free in him. And that's amazing, we love that. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with baptism. I mean, we want you to learn about God and go to things like classes and groups and, and get the study guide and expand your view of God. He is your rescuer, but he's so much bigger than that. And that's why there's 66 books of the Bible written by 40 plus authors over 1500 years. They're all pointing to who God is. And we want you to see that and respond accordingly. And that's what we're doing here. And that's what Moses is helping us do here, is reminding us everything starts with God. So that means this, your life starts with God. Your marriage starts with God. It doesn't start with whether you think you still like the person or not. It doesn't start with whether they do this and then you'll do this. No, it starts with God did this. He set up marriage and this is how we respond, amen? Your marriage starts with God. Your finances start with God. Your whole life is up under the rule and reign of God. That's where it all starts. And that's where Genesis starts. In the beginning, not you, but God. And I think when we think about that, we have to point out, like sometimes we think about that, we're like, man, that must have been really lonely for God. I mean, he didn't have us. We I mean, didn't have the birds and the creatures and the sea. Like, he didn't have all this stuff. Like, God, man, you just really needed some people to hang out with. And what I would tell you is what Genesis tells us is that couldn't be further from the truth. <laughs> that God does love you, but he does not need you. You do not consult him. He is fine without us. He is self-existent. We see that in the Trinity, which you see a glimpse of even in this text. You see God the Father is designing all the universe while the Spirit, God the Spirit, is hovering over the waters. And John chapter one will tell us that in the beginning here also is Jesus Christ. You have the triune God, one essence, three persons. Even when he creates man in his own image in a little bit, it says, let us make man in our own image. You need to know that God is self-existent. The triune God is eternal, is infinite. And he was in perfect unity and community with himself before he created us. Do you see God like that? Is that your view of God? Our response should be according to that. It's the second thing. Some of you are like, that's verse one, Tim. How long are we gonna be here? We'll find out. We're gonna go a lot faster. Second thing is God is all powerful. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now I wanna point out here something that some of you may debate about, something you may wonder about. You see this phrase, the earth was formless and void. 
And then as we go on to read, what we see is each day of creation, right? There's six days of creation. God begins to order creation, but at one point it was formless. It was void. So just want to acknowledge right off the bat. A lot of people will argue and debate, okay, so how long between the earth being created and yet formless and void till day one when he starts to really order creation and put it all into existence? And, and people will debate, like, maybe it was all in the, the day one. And some people will debate who are like, uh, that's more young earth people. Some people, old earth people, the earth's been around for billions, billions of years. They'll say, no, no, no. Okay, this was God creating all matter, but it could have been thousands of years before the next verse. And then God ordered everything. And then the next debate is, is, is that we look at the days. Are those six or seven with God resting, six, seven, 24 hour literal days? Or are they periods of time? And you know, the reason why people think that is because you look at Second Peter and Peter says, hey, a, a day to God is like a thousand years. And then there's other parts of the New Testament that will talk about the day of the Lord, which is the returning judgment of the Lord, which is not just one day. Unfortunately, it's a season, it's a period of time. And, and, and then we'll look back and say, well, yeah, but it, but it seems like 24 hour days because it says morning and evening. And then some people will say, no, 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 morning and evening is just a significant symbol for start and finish of each time. And listen to me, Bible believing Christians who love Jesus and worship him and go to this church believe different things about this. And some of you who have extreme views of this, you're like, no way, my view is right. And what I would just tell you is like, man, let's, let's debate that later. Let's talk about it. It is kind of fun to think about, but, but don't get distracted. God gives two chapters to creation. Do you think if he wanted to dissect how and when of creation, do you think he would have given more than two chapters to it? I think so. Do you think he would have defined some words like day for like, but that wasn't his point. What's his point? It's not how, it's not when, it's who, that's why for us at Phoenix Bible Church, open-handed, young earth, old earth, we can talk about it, have fun with it, but closed-handed, in the beginning, God created. That he's an all-powerful God, that he did it. And that he did it out of nothing. If you look at that word created, uh, the word in the Hebrew is never used of anybody but God. It's unique to God. It's this word ex nihilo. It's out of nothing, God made something. Right? And you know, that's different than the way we create things, right? That God, out of nothing, he made something. He didn't have an inspiration for the universe. He didn't look at something else and think, oh, how do you do that? I'm gonna do that too. He didn't look at an Ikea instruction manual, praise God, right? He didn't watch YouTube for a few hours. He didn't figure it out. Like, listen to me. I know sometimes we have a small view of God. Broaden your view of God. God thought up the universe, the planets that he set in motion, the stars, the galaxies. You, God thought it all up internally. And then what's crazy to me is he didn't have to figure it out. He didn't, does this go here? No, that's not gonna work. I gotta switch this out. I gotta start all over. He didn't have to figure anything out and he didn't even have to lift a finger. He spoke it into existence. That's how all powerful, that's how big God is. That's different than the way we create things. Just the other day, I was uh, helping put together, my wife deserves all the credit for this. Uh, I was helping my wife put together a vanity for my 14 year old daughter. Yeah, it was a big deal. Um, she can order, organize all her makeups, get the lights on her, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, my wife spent a lot more time than I did, but she was having trouble with the lights and getting them installed. And so as the husband who already, man, I turned in my man card a long time ago. So just, just to let y'all know, I'm not handy, but I just said, hey, babe, let me help with that. And man, like three hours later <laughs> and 40 YouTube videos later, I was like kneeled under this vanity, like all awkward contorting my body, trying to put these lights in and figure it out. Do you know what God puts together the entire universe and doesn't have to do any of that? and just literally breathed out words and the cosmos was created. Just over and over in Genesis chapter one, we see these key phrases repeated like, and God said, let there be, and it was so. And God 
God said, let there be, and it was so. He's not down on all fours trying to figure the thing out. Yet there's like a sun that's 184,000 miles wide, that's hot enough, that's warm enough to keep us alive and plants and vegetation alive, but not too close to harm us. You know, everything requires faith. We're not going to get into this today, but if you look at science and Big Bang and all these kinds of things, like the alternative views, they say, well, no, we're about science, not faith. Okay, so you, you believe just like there was matter somehow, somewhere, and something caused it to explode and organized perfectly with exact spacing as we just talked about to create human life on the earth so that in 2024, we're still alive and a, and a muscle the size of our fist is pumping right now, keeping us alive. And so you think like just science, like it just happened. <laughs> that takes faith too, amen? So which faith are you gonna have? I'm going to choose intelligent design every single day with my mind. Nobody's checking their mind at the door at Phoenix Bible Church. We're saying, no, we, we believe God did this. He spoke it, and we're broadening our view of him. I hope you're doing that. Do you see God as all-powerful? Do you see God, like Psalm 33 says, that for he speaks and it comes to be? Like Hebrews 1.3, he upholds the entire universe, sustains it right now. How? by the power of his word. My my thought, I was thinking about this this week. So if all of the universe obeys the word of God like that, how how should we obey the word of God? How should we respond when God speaks? When God speaks in your life to tell you how how to live, how to manage your finances, how to do marriage, how to do friendship, how to do church, like how, how should we respond? If that's how the universe responds to the word of God, how should you and I respond? Is your view of God too small? Just from Genesis chapter one, we see he's self-existent. He's all powerful. Here's the last thing. He is awe inspiring. That as God creates everything with the power of his word, what we are seeing is the master designer at work. Like Chip and Joanna Gaines have nothing on God. Amen? Like God, God's thinking all this stuff. Let's put this over here, this waterfall and this mountain range and this plane and let's do all, let's put this sun and these planets, let's hang, let's, let's do all of that. God is this awe-inspiring master designer. And let me just tell you, we're looking at a lot of verses, a lot of days. And so I wanted to group it up so we could see it concisely together. So the first thing we see is day one and day four, God creates light. Verse three, look at that verse. It says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 16, that's day four. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Just briefly here, many of us will wonder if you really look intently, okay, so God created light on day one, but not till day four does he create the sun. How does that work? And some of you have wondered that. And some of you have never wondered that till now. Okay? But I, I just, I want to tell you, this is one of those things. God doesn't give us a roadmap. God doesn't break down the specs of this, right? He just tells us this. But what we do when we're confused about things like this is we always let Scripture interpret Scripture. So as we fast forward to places in the New Testament, like the book of 1 John, where it, John, where it says, God is light. Like in the Gospels, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Like in Revelation chapter 22, when, when we see that we won't need the sun in eternity because we'll have the very light of God himself. There's some aspect where God, he's so big, he's so powerful that he is, emits light from himself. And then on day four, he actually creates the sun. You know, just a 184,000 mile wide ball of fire that's gonna rise and it's gonna set and it's gonna bring us light. Right? God did that. He thought that up. He designed it. Then we see day two, the sky or expanse is created. Verse six, look at that verse. It says, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. That you think about, it, you have waters in the clouds up above and then you have waters down below in the seas and the lakes and the rivers. And God separated that with what we call sky. Day three, he creates land and water and vegetation. Verse nine, it says, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. 
God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, right? The dominoes just started falling, right? And we have vegetation because we have water and we have land. We see God thought that up. Day five and six, he creates animals and humans. Verse 20 says, and God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. Then God said, let us make man. In our image, there's the Trinity after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Talking way more about that next week, but God creates humans. And I want you to notice in this passage, again, we have key phrases repeated. One of those key phrases is, and it was good. And it was good. And it was good. And at the end of creating humanity. We'll talk about this next week. And it was very good. See, I I know we have a sinful world, a broken world, a distorted creation, but by God's grace, how big is God? By God's grace, we can still look around and see his creativity on display. We can see the, the beauty and the functionality of all of these things still today, all these years later, God has preserved his wonderful creation. Aren't you glad? Where it's still all inspiring Like light. Like just think about the, the function and the beauty of light. I, I was thinking about it the other day because in my closet, my, the string that we pull down to turn on the light in our closet, it just broke. And I'll just be honest with you, I didn't appreciate the functionality of light. Till I was like trying to navigate, is that black or is that navy? Like, I don't, and some of you are like, yeah, we can tell. You couldn't, you couldn't tell. (laughs) And I couldn't for a while. Like I needed light and we got it reinstalled. Like, you know, four days later, again, you know, just my handiness. Um, Then I was like, oh man, I'm so thankful for light in my closet. But it's not just like the, the functionality of light. Like, again, we know, like, we know the sun in Phoenix. Do I need to say more? (laughs) You know how the sun works, right? Like I thought about throwing pictures up of the sun, but I was just like, I think you got it, okay? But as I just think about the beauty of light, man, one thing you haven't seen is the light in our chapel stained glass. But you can see it now. I think we have a picture of it, maybe. Let there be light. (laughs) Okay, maybe at some point we'll see a picture of our stained glass. But if you don't see it on the screen, drive by our chapel at night on 7th Avenue. Like after, like we've been in this building for a year, I just was like, hey guys, can we, can we mount some lights and shine through that stained glass? And so that when you drive by at night, you can actually tell it's stained glass. And just like last week, some pe- people in our church, they got up on really high, like cherry pickers, really scary. And they installed some lights. And so every night at dusk, you can drive by on 7th Avenue and see light coming through. And it's not just like, well, that's a cool accent. It was just, how can we let this community know the beauty of Jesus Christ, the light of Christ? And how could just something really simple like stained glass, how could it do that? Let me just tell you, my kids and I drove by the other day and all of them were just like, wow. And some of that's because their dad's the pastor and they know it was my idea, (laughs) okay? But some of that was like, they were legit like, that's really beautiful because that's what light, that's what light does. And as we look at other things like the land and water and vegetation, and I thought about showing you pics of like the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, the glaciers of Iceland. But listen, why go somewhere else when you can stay right here in AZ with Havasupai Falls, right? And I think maybe we don't have pictures for any of this and that's okay, guys. We're restarting it right now. So don't look up, don't look back, just look at me. <laughs> Try to imagine Havasupai Falls. Have you ever seen pictures of it? That blue turquoise waterfall just falling down. Did you know that's not just one falls, that there's like five of them? There's like the Navajo Falls, there's Mooney Falls, there's Beaver Falls, in addition to Havasupai Falls. 
that my wife, we got to hike down into those falls, 13 miles with a big backpack. And I sprained my ankle (laughs) and it hurt so bad walking down in there. And listen to me, I did not care because it was so beautiful and magnificent. And I would do it again. Like my hamstrings have finally recovered all these years later. And I would do it again because it's, it's just immaculate. It's beautiful. You know, God thought that up. Like the calcium and magnesium in the rocks that would naturally over time turn the water blue turquoise. God thought up calcium and magnesium in rocks and blue and turquoise. Do you see God like that? Do you see how big he is? Even just in creation with land and water and vegetation, with animals. Uh, I looked up mandarin fish, that no two mandarin fish have the same color combination. These are fish off the coast of Australia and every single one of them has a unique color combination. I think about the turtles in Kauai, Hawaii. My wife went there several years ago when I was on sabbatical and how every evening at the same exact time, this family of turtles would come through the water and come out onto the shore. And the lifeguard would yell at everybody to get out and not touch them because it's illegal in Hawaii. And they knew it like clockwork. And we just look at these turtles. I thought about the pinnacle of all the creatures of all of creation, your dog. <laughs> right, we got a picture of Lincoln. You're not gonna see it. You'll see it later, I promise. I'll, I'll share it with you on social media. But I just took a picture of my dog last night, Lincoln, this 115 pound golden retriever, this gentle giant who every single morning, my little eight-year-old daughter gets up and lays on him like flat and she extends over his whole body. And he doesn't do anything, he lets her do it. And I'm always like, man, God created that. And some of you know, you have a, you have a dog, right? You have cats, we'll pray for you, okay? <laughs> So, you know, just the unconditional love you get from your dog. There's just some days as a pastor where like everything in the world is broken and politics is broken and people are broken and my life is is difficult and things like that. And I just come home and Lincoln is there and he just loves me. And as everything else changes in life, Lincoln never changes. He loves me. He's addicted to my love, some might say. Did you know God created dogs and cats? Okay to humble us for sanctification. (laughs) Some of you are highly offended right now. I apologize. Um, That God thought all of that up. He thought you up. That all the different combinations of cells that you have in your body, in your brain alone, they're all unique. They're all different. And God thought you up and he created you, not with an instruction manual. Now, if you don't see God as amazing, I didn't even know how to like capture it in this third point, like awe-inspiring. I wanted a hyphenated word just to be honest with you. (laughs) But just like amazing, awesome, like this is your God. This is how big he is. He transcends everything you can ever think, ask, or imagine. And yet as we read continuously in scripture to the New Testament, what we see is that God transcends all but he also condescends to all, that God puts on flesh. See, God's not some force that's standing back and just looking at his creation and and standing back really distant from all of you puny humans. No, God puts on flesh. He becomes a baby. He's born in a stable. He lives a perfect life that you can never live. He dies on a cross, the death of a criminal in your place for your sin. And the story doesn't end there. Praise God, he rises again in victory over all of sin so that you could have a relationship with him. That a big God became small to show you that he loves you. Do you see God like that? Because I'll be honest with you, this is a battle to see God like this. Some of us, it's, it's a battle because we're just like, Tim, I, I've never read Genesis like this. I didn't know these things about God. I didn't know he was self-existent, all-powerful, all-inspired. Like I, just, I just haven't learned that yet. Man, we love it that you are here and we wanna invite you to learn these things. Join a class, join a group, dig in with us to learn who this God is and respond to him accordingly. Get baptized on the 11th if you haven't been already. And some of you just didn't know. But here's the reality for a lot of us in this room. You did know who God was kind of know who God is. 
you've kind of read your Bible. You've come to church for a while. And at one point, you were in awe. You saw God as big. But over the course of your life, you just got a little bit smaller because work got a little bit bigger. Because keeping up with the Joneses got a little bit bigger. Because Instagram and Netflix got a little bit bigger. And your classes and your status just got a little bit bigger. So over time, the reality is we're making God just a little bit smaller. And those things just a little bit bigger. And then you wonder, like, you see other people worshiping Jesus and they're raising their hands and you're like, ah, I used to, I used to, I don't even feel like raising my hands today. You see other people coming down for prayer at the end of the service. You're like, ah, how cute. I, I remember when I was like, really wanted God like that. And I would come down even in front of people and pray together with other people. And like, I didn't care what people thought of me. Like, I remember there was a time like that. But I, you know, I got to go to lunch and I worked this week. And, you know, my, my wife and we got these things that we're working through and just my classes and like, yeah, Instagram. I was just checking, how many likes do I have on that one now? Why, why does she not like it? <laughs> and it's like, and we're singing about the majesty and the greatness of God. And you're just like, got your arms folded. What I would say is your, your, your view of God determines your response to God. And some of us, we need to repent of having too small of a view of God. This is a battle. It's a battle for your pastor at times, right? And, and some of it's because of my own flesh and I'm selfish and I, I, I wanna treat myself, okay? And some of it, I just wanna be about me, right? Because I'm sinful, just like you are. But sometimes it's, it's not just me, it's not my flesh, it's, it's Satan. You know, Satan, he doesn't need to convince you that God doesn't exist. He just needs to convince you that God isn't worth it. That God's too small. And you said, man, just put that over here. That's, that's just one part of your life. And it's Satan, every day, he's trying to convince you of that. Right now, he's trying to convince you of that. It's a battle. And we have to continually go back to scripture, and continue to go back to Jesus. And say, no, God, you're bigger. You're bigger than I can ever think, ask, or imagine. And I want my life to fit up under that. And as I was doing that several weeks ago in my quiet time with God, and I was just kind of realizing, hey, God, I'm letting the brokenness of my life and our world and our church and politics and, and challenges facing my kids. I'm just, I'm stacking all these things up. And if I'm honest right now, they're outweighing you a little bit and they're a little bit bigger than you. And I'm trying to look at the word and I'm trying to listen to worship songs and it's just not doing anything for me. And this one song came on, and it was called Fall Like Rain. And it had this line, it just said, I don't want to lose the wonder of your presence. So I just started to listen to that, and then that song ended, and then Spotify, I don't know how it does it, it jumps to another song. I didn't hit any buttons. And the very next song was a song called Tethered by Phil Wickham, and it had the exact same line. God, we don't ever want to lose the wonder of being in your presence. And I'll be honest with you, I had two thoughts in that moment. Who thought of it first? Who stole from who? <laughs> it's a great line. And then the next thing I thought was like, God, maybe you're trying to tell me something. Maybe I've lost the wonder of your presence. Maybe I've allowed some things to become too big and I've made you too small. And I just had to repent. And then I had to worship. And so that's what I want us to do this morning. How do you view God? Your response to God is a direct correlation to how you view him. And some of you are like, ah, it's a new year, new me. Like I'm trying to come to church, read my Bible, get up early, set my alarm, join a group, serve somebody. And it's all your response. And you're not looking at how big God is. That's what you need to do first. That's what happens first in all of our Bibles. Everything else flows from that. And some of us wonder what that looks like. I want to tell you, Psalm 95. Here's what this looks like right now. Here's what we do in response to a big God. You ready? Psalm 95, the Lord is the great God the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. So how do we respond? Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We worship a big God. And that's what we're gonna do right now. You ready? Let's pray as we ready our hearts together. Father in heaven, thank you for being so big. God, I pray this morning that we would repent 
of our view of you as small. However we got there, God, we would begin right now, just stop listening to me and start talking to you and start looking at a God who is self-existent, a God who is all powerful, a God who, who is all inspiring. God, that you would be so big and yet become so small to be born in the likeness of man, to be born as a baby, to live a life that we could never live, to die a death that we deserved and to rise again in victory and that you want to know us despite the fact that we're so small and despite the fact that we're, you're so big and we don't deserve it. God, you are worthy of it all. May we worship you like that, Jesus. God, may we see you as you are and respond accordingly as one body this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.